It's, it's hard to talk about. I don't know really know where to start, but right from when I was a child, one thing I was aware of, that lack of love in our home. My mum and dad was always arguing. My mum had a very violent temper. And uh, from the age of about five and a half, six, I can vividly remember being hit on many occasions. Um, uh, it wasn't just normal hitting. Like we'd get a copper stick beaten over us or a chair broken over our back or kicked or, you know, we got to the point where me and my sister used to be terrified to come in the house. I can't remember my mother not ramping and raving about something or watching her kick my dad about and he would just stand there and take it. And uh, from a very early age, I, I became to, you know, loathe, hate my mum. And also my dad, not because he, he wasn't the loving person, he was really gentle, but I detested him because to me he was just a coward letting a woman uh, do that to him. I was very nervous um, before eventually when I became violent, but in the early days I was very... Uh, withdrawn, very quiet, and yeah, my, my, my uh, education was hampered, yeah, because I had mates at that time. Uh, many of them were, were, were turned out to be villains and that, um, and I presumed that I was a big influence in their lives, but no, and I was to look at them, you used to take my cousin, we were mates from the age of about 10, 8 maybe, uh, we used to go around uh, playing together, we, we, we'd go around, and his mother would always uh, but, but be loving to him. Give him. Even when we was 13 and 14, we used to smoke, you know, kids are not smoking. She would, she would give him a fag or give me a fag and things like that. You know, I know she'd done some things that were wrong, but there's that loving and caring. Uh, she'd always give him sixpence in those days to go to ABC Miners, you know, the Sunday, Saturday morning thing. Yeah. And I was never given that. Um, uh, many times my mum would say, you dig the allotment on that and do this and do that and you'll get sixpence to go to pictures. But when I'd done all that, then I wouldn't get the money. There must have been a time when you did have laughs. Oh, yeah, I mean, from a very early age, I can remember thieving. I think that comes because, I don't know if you're looking for attention or you want the things that other kids have, but me and my sister would go in Woolworths and shoplift. I remember we used to play hooky at school. Me and the fellas that I eventually become members of the gang, we, we would get our mark and then we used to have to go across the playing fields to the woodwork shed and we'd fall out and go into the toilets and we'd leg it up over the toilet wall. across the playing fields and away down to the old river which we used to call the Black Dam and we'd smoke and make dens and things like that. The school attendance office was only about my mum's house but that was just another ride and I could take it. Just, I got to the point where beatings didn't bother me in the end. went on to that age when I was 13, 14. She was one of her rages one day, pulling out handfuls of my hair and beating me, and something snapped in me. And uh, the next thing I knew, my mum was on the floor unconscious. I beat her back. First time ever at back. And that was a point in my life where I said, never again was anyone going to knock me around and abuse me. And that was the turning point. Uh, from there on, my shyness from school went. I would use my fist and settle all the problems. I'd become totally unruly. Uh, teachers couldn't handle me. People couldn't handle me. And my first crime was when we broke into a rugby club. First of all, just for mischief, me and Jock, that's my cousin, the other guy, I always used to went around where we used to fight together back to back so we wouldn't get a bottle on the back of our head. And we spent our own life together before he was killed. And we were just wrestling about him. He slung me up against this club wall uh, and uh, the door opened. We went in there just to do a bit of mischief. And we thought, well, oh, come on, let's have a laugh. We went to the first aid room and we got out the scissors and then we found the, the rugby player shorts and we just cut all the middle sections out and said, you know, we'll let all that hang out when they go out Saturday, just have a giggle. 
and then we got the oranges and started firing the oranges around away. And doing you know, mischief in general, mm. putting stuff in the boots and things like that, we thought we'd cause a bit of a giggle. And all of a sudden, just with no warning at all, you know, this is how evil evil is. You know, all of a sudden I started seeing my mum's face on light fittings, uh, different things, and I just took an iron bar and something just snapped and I just le leveled the place. And, uh, uh, well, you know, Jock was trying to call me down, my cousin. He said, you've gone off the head, what's wrong? And we eventually left the place, but before we left, uh, or we just wrote our initials, uh, Jock and Sammy, that was my nickname in those days, played hooky on such and such a day. So I didn't take the bill long enough to find out, you know, put two and two together who'd done the job. And we went to court and I was pro on probation and found about 30 quid and then the 40s, that was an awful lot of money. It meant my mum had to pay it, it meant another beating. And what happened after that? Well, eventually I left school, but I was I got into trouble. I mean, I would go out Friday nights, I wouldn't come back into Monday mornings. I'd spend two and three days at a time in London. Uh, I didn't care what my mother said. I didn't care. I was beyond control, beyond up. She couldn't even control me at that point. And uh, I, I always warned her, you touch me again and I'll kill you. And uh, things got unbearable in the house. That in the end, that she just didn't bother. Um, I would get involved with all manner of crime. I'd thieve. Uh, I broke into places, sell stuff. I was working on the railway at that time. I got involved. You know, you used to get privilege tickets if you worked on the railway. It means you could travel third price. And I used to get these and flog them off to people. Uh, other stuff I got found out about, lost my job. Many other crimes. Broke into a warehouse, uh, stole loads and loads of stuff. And I would just go around uh, conning people, you know, going to shops and things like that and tell them that I was an insurance broker. Uh, through a bankruptcy firm, or this was uh, fire damage gear, mm -hmm. and I would flog it that way. Eventually I met up with a young girl, and uh, I got married at the age of 19. After one week of being married to her, uh, I went to court, and uh, obviously they found out about a lot of other crimes. Uh, one of these crimes involved a large amount of whiskey, alcohol, and cigarettes, uh, thousands and thousands of pounds worth. And I ended up in court with uh, all members of the gang, about 20 of us. And when the magistrate started sentence, it started off with fines and probation. And when it got to me and Jock again, it was down to Winchester for uh, uh, medical reports. And the report came back, these men are too violent. They've got to go to prison. And off I went to Lewis Prison in Sussex. At that time, it, that was the hardest YP, young people's prison in the country. <laughs> I became an animal to survive the jungle. Now, it didn't improve me, it made me worse. And I really generally wanted to go straight, but my wife wasn't interested in that. Uh, she's very irresponsible. She married from what I was. As much as I'd try to see, I know now that to get out of that position, I should have got out of Basin, got out of the town where I was born, got away from the environment. And in those days, when you come out of prison, you used to have a national insurance card and all the weeks it never had a stamp, it'd have HMP or Majesty's Prison. So everyone knew where you'd been and you couldn't get a job anyhow. Ron, I believe you started a small business. Oh yeah, and first of all it was a construction, I used to subcontract and do curb laying and things like that. I still had all my mates working for me. And I used to do many hours work and generally work hard. But somehow things used to just go wrong. It seems that everything was just, every time I'd try to go right, things were stacked against me. Yeah, eventually I got led back into crime to keep my family together. And again, I, and I went into prison. This time it was Winchester. I'd done a nine-month spell in there. Met up with all kind of criminals. And most of what I was doing later on in life, I learnt the trade in there. And uh, I came out, and again, I was determined to go straight. I wanted to go straight. I had a paint and decorating business then. On a number of occasions, my wife would leave me. I used to wander around the streets with one baby in the pram and two on the handles. Even an animal don't desert his children. And in the end, I knew what had happened. I mean, I remember one night I'd come home from work because I used to get up early hours in the morning, uh, put the kids into nursery, to school, go to, go to work, come home, do the washing. And I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And one night I come home, the welfare were there, and they said, we've come to take the kids. You can't go on like this. And I just blew my top. and. Uh, but eventually my wife came back, we got back, and uh, I planned to murder her this time. I used to just scream and say, this can't be happening to me. This, this isn't happening. It's just a bad dream. 
I'm going to wake up. I just could not believe this was happening to me. Was there anyone who you felt could help you? Nobody. It turned to drugs. Yeah, I was on second of sodium, amateur sodium. Um, other drugs, just, just, just enough to just block it out. I mean, many, many times I almost killed myself. Many times I'd be taken in to be pumped out and things like that for a drug overdose, yeah. I planned to kill my wife for a start because I knew she was going to clear off as soon as I tried to go straight and my kids were going to go in. And I just wanted to keep my family together. And I dug a hole under a bottle of pigeon loft and I was going to murder and bury her there. Two days before I did that, she went. Otherwise, I'd done it. But what really made me sure that I was never going to get involved in that kind of crime again, I remember when she came back again and to keep my family. You see, people say, if you were such a hard case, Ron, why do you let a woman treat you like this? You see, I loved her. I don't know if people can understand that. And above all, I love my children. And I, they were my life. And if it meant I had to go to hell for them, I was prepared to do it. I didn't care about what people thought of me. I didn't care what I appeared. As long as I had my wife and my family, uh, you know, I was holding on to desperately to what, to me, was the only thing that mattered to me in my life. And, um, yeah, and I was on top of this roof pulling a job off with a mate in a bigger estate and we was going to take all the lead off this roof, thousands of pounds worth. And whilst we were doing this, this uh, car pulled up with two plain clothes boats. The first thing that went into my head, detectives. And I picked up the axe and I said to my mate, the first police comes through that door. I'm taking his head off me. I, would, I was that vicious, I would have killed them. But by the grace of God, there were two estate agents looking over the property. And when I realised how close I'd come to murdering the policemen, I said, no way, that was enough. And I decided from there on I was going to go straight, yeah. When you decided to try and go straight, how did it actually work out? Every time there was a crime in my head, obviously I was the number one suspect. And I would keep telling them that I'm trying to go straight, but I'd go on ID parades. Now, in the end, yeah, I was approached to be an informer. If I did, it would prove to them that I was going straight. And I agreed to be an informer, and that's a statement to say. That's the lowest, that's the scum mm -hmm. you can become to be an informer or grass. That you can't go no lower than that in the criminal world. But again, to keep my family together, uh, and to, I believed that you know, I was listening to what these people were saying. So to prove that I was trying to go straight away on the inside, and got this bloke got set up, they made a raid. When the raid went through, I was allowed to get out the back door. This bloke was charged, sentenced to prison. There was only one thing wrong. My wife informed his mates on what I'd done, so was a, they were out to get even with me, obviously. Because of my reputation, they knew that if you're going to get Ron Sims, you better kill him, because if you don't, he'll get up and kill you. And probably it was my reputation that kept me alive, but they informed the police on many jobs that I'd committed over many periods of years. So really, you ended up in a worse mess? Yeah, uh, they sent me down to appear before Lord Justice Roscoe at the Winchester Quarter Sessions uh, with a recommendation that I serve between three to five years preventive detention, which would mean Dartmoor. I knew that if the guys in prison found out I was in form, I'd been the dead man inside minutes. Mm. And uh, then I heard my wife was uh, going to, to, to divorce me. And I try to kill myself like many blokes do, as many people kill themselves in prisons. You see, I got so desperate at one point in that hospital block in that cell that I remember dropping to my knees one night and just screaming out in desperation that if there's a God, um, you know, please help me. Uh, but yeah, a miracle happened. I came and caught miraculously. This man, policeman, got up and said that I'd been working for them. I mean, the judge looked at me, he said, I'm going to give you a chance. You've got three years. And I thought, well, three years, I'll get through that. But then he said the word probation, and that was a miracle. Um, within minutes, I was outside, free. And I'm back home where I started with my mum. And I had a big chip on my shoulder. You know, my mum had abused me. My first wife had abused me. And I decided then from there on, never again would I ever trust a woman. Would ever a woman use me? From now on, I would use women. At what point did you meet your second wife? Oh, yeah, I, went, I went to work at a school. I used to coach them in football. And it was whilst I was there that my wife came through for a job. 
Now, I had nothing to do with women for two years, I didn't want to do it, but this young girl came in, blonde hair, uh, mini skirt, I mean, the kids were uh, saying, wow. She was actually married, she had a bad marriage. Uh, we seemed to have a lot in common, and we went away together, but it was mostly for company. I, mean, I, I thought she was attractive in that, and I suppose in my own way, I loved her to a certain extent. But as I said before, I had one foot on the bank, ready to pull my sight, never again was a woman going to use me. It was whilst I was working on the motorway that I got involved with a gang from London that were involved in uh, supplying pornography and movies and such as that. And um, yeah, I used to go up to London every week in a van and bring out a van loads of stuff of pornography. Drugs, uh, pornography, and that all go together. And my mate at that time was a drug dealer, and I was taking drugs myself, smoking marijuana. So was Maureen. I mean, Maureen didn't want nothing to do it. You know, I used to get over and just smash her in the face, chuck her through the door and say, if you don't want to know it, because obviously she wasn't brought up into that kind of upbringing, and she didn't want nothing to do with it. And I would just abuse her and chuck her out and say, you either get involved or you can go, and you can take the kids with you. That's how the evil I became. I'm not trying to be a sloppy customer, but she was so in love with me that she would, she would drive me. She just, she just got involved in the pornography and the drugs that, and I physically, mentally, spiritually, and morally dis totally destroyed her. If you saw her come on one Friday night, uh, as per usual, cocky, load of mouth, money everywhere, and as I come through my front door, I collapsed, blood shot from my nose, I screamed with pains in my chest. Um, I was rushed to Bayesian Hospital, and that's where I suffered a massive heart attack at four o'clock in the morning. I remember it. Um, I could see him hit me with electric irons, putting needles into my arm. I was queued up onto a heart thermometer. Uh, I remember uh, the doctor saying, we're losing him, he's going, he's going. And I thought, what am I, what am I on about? I'm going, I'm going, I'm alive. Um, I was frightened, imagine they were going to cut me up and I was still alive. But in fact, I died in for a couple of three minutes. Within an hour, I had another heart attack and I was put into a side ward uh, in the recovery ward, wasn't expected to live. And that's when a nun came in and she said to me she had a vision that Jesus was calling me for something special and that I wasn't going to die. Uh, besides laughing, I swore at her and told her to get on a bike and get out of the ward. But nine days later, I left the hospital. And in fact, I was given a pension of 70 pounds a week and more or less to told to go home, take it easy and wait to die. Your lifestyle changed, Ron. How did you fill your days? Yeah, I mean, I tried to go back to work, but that was impossible. And it's whilst I was down the cub up once, I struggled down there, uh, talking to him a bit about football and encouraging him. Well, I see this bloke running around on the floor. He never had no dog collar, just an ordinary bloke. And I was introduced to him as uh, Reverend Trevor Jones of the local Baptist church. And uh, we got chatting about things. And what I loved about this bloke, I mean, he, I always thought these vicars talked with a plum in their mouth and talked down to you. But this bloke was talking to me just ordinary on the same level, no dog collar. And I said, well, you don't wear a dog collar. He said, no, I don't leave it. I don't need a dog collar to prove I'm a man of God. He says, well, you know, you knew the man really lived his faith. And, uh, and I could see, you know, it's funny how an old villain can see honesty. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you go into prisons, first thing they do is size you up, and they know if you're conning them or not. And uh, you can't con an old con, you know. This boat wasn't conning me. He was genuine. And uh, he said, I would like to come down your house and talk to you again. Well, I remember when I came home, um, I started humming this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And that was when I was a kid in the Salvation Army, a kid of eight, I'd learned that. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, it was back, and now this morning I thought I'd gone off my head when I told her about this minister that was coming to my house. Uh, but she said, you know, whatever makes you happy, that's fine. Shovel says you'd be around for about a quarter of an hour, about the the minister from the Baptist Church. Where are you going at now? Come to see me. Hi, oh, Trev. Oh, yeah. Better late than ever, mate. Yeah, come that's in. right. Good to see you on now. Yeah. Oh. yeah, this bloke come and see me, and he taught me about the Lord, told me about the prodigal son, told me a lot of things oh, about Jesus, said yeah, that uh, he believed that God was calling me for something special. Oh, Jesus, and what I can do for you. Yeah. Right. Mm. Now, do you really think he's interested? No, nah, not really. Not a bloke. Uh, you know, I used to go to Sunday school when I was a youngster, yeah. but the state of my life, I wouldn't think God could forgive me for what I've been doing there. Yeah. 
Well, I'm here to say that he, he can. And, um, well, that didn't sink in. But he gave me a load of books. Give me, you know, you'd use your track stuff, you know. Uh, Obviously, was a long way from the Lord at one point. He did a lot mm. of things that were wrong. But in fact, he met Jesus in prison, and Jesus forgave him and changed his life. Yeah. And what I'm saying to you is, he can do the same for you. What about it? And he oh, went yeah. that night. Me and Warren went to bed early, and I started the route looking for this literature. Give me, you know, you'd use your track stuff, you know. Uh, mm. Jesus loves you. Jesus is the good shepherd. And I was just throwing them away, you know. Then all of a sudden, I. What he did was put a book there, and this book was had a fist with a chain around it. And it was a true story of a guy like me, Brian Greenaway, Hell's Angel. Now he met with Jesus in prison. And I read this story, and I, I, you know, I couldn't believe what I was reading. He'd been a bloke like me, been through much of the same thing like me. Uh, he, he'd been in, he was in prison serving five years for malicious wounding two people. And how Jesus has come to him, we know we've heard lots of stories about guys who've had visions of Jesus or Jesus come to him in prisons and told him that above all, not only was he come, but they could be forgiven. You know, and I was reading there about a man who died for me that I could be forgiven. I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, next to me was Maureen that I'd almost destroyed. She hated me. And my family, my boys next door, they didn't have two hoots for me. And I was dying and I deserved to die. And I, I just read this book about, not only had Jesus come to Brian Greenaway in prison and forgiven him, but he went on to become a minister. And right to this very day, he's still part of the London City Mission going into prisons. And I thought, but that's no good, I'm dying, and God couldn't use me. But all I knew that God was saying something to me, I need you. And I just said, okay, God, if you're for real, you can have me. And I knew I'd been saved. I mean, for the first time in my life, I really cried, cried for Ron. Uh, it hurts now, but I kn can you understand that I knew I'd been forgiven? Mm -hmm. All the hate I went through and all the hurt seemed to just drain out of me. And, uh, and I looked at more and I just cried even more and I said, God, why did you allow that? Why did you allow my mum to hit me? Why did I go to prison? Why did my first marriage break down? Why did I get involved in this muck? Why did I do this to more? No, etc., etc. And I know I heard Jesus say deep in my heart, I allowed you to live in that evil world. Now I want you to go out and show it, God. <laughs> First thing that happened, <laughs> I got up in the morning and I said um, to her and the boys, we're going to church, and they thought they all thought I'd gone completely as crackers by now. But we went down to the local Baptist church. You imagine what they thought when they seen me walking in there. But that was the start of it. Uh, next thing I said, we got to go and knock the doors, and, and uh, the minister said, you what? I said, we got to knock the doors everywhere in Hartley, Whitney. I want everyone to know that there's, I thought I was the first guy that found this Jesus. <laughs> and. Uh, well, I don't think he'd done it out of law to you because he felt God would tell I thought he'd done it more out of fear because we were on the same as us. But we went round the doors and Hartley went and told him about Jesus. The change in me was so much that within six weeks, a morning said to Trevor, I don't know what's happened to Ron, but what's ever happened to him, I want. And she gave her heart to the Lord. And then eventually my whole family, my three boys, gave their heart to the Lord. And this old house is just on fire for Jesus. The most evil, rotten thing terrifying thing ever happened in my life was prison. Uh, I now go back into prison with a Bible. Um, telling the guys now about Jesus, what he's done for me. And you've seen some of the stories that are on the letters. I've seen hundreds of men in prisons all over this country come to Jesus. And they're not freak. it's not a freak story. Not only as prisoners, but prison officers, prison governors, prison staff are coming to know Jesus as well. And you know, I also, I'm also a member of the Christian Police Association. You understand that? My sworn enemies, men that I wouldn't have thought about killing before, I now go around with chief constables. Let's sweat up. I could be out in that world making a fortune. Why do I want to sit here? Why do I go around churches? Why do I write? Why have I written this story? Why am I, I don't travel four and five hundred miles to go into a prison and, and to go back in the hell that I've just come out of to relieve that clanging and banging of keys to tell a story that's just a load of, just a joke. The most thing, best of all, you know, I'm getting really excited, as you can see. You know, what I love Jesus about, most of all, I can love somebody, you know? Not only do I love Jesus, most of all, but I love my wife, and she loves me. Yeah, we've done some rotten things to each other and with other people, but you see, when anyone's in Christ Jesus, they're new creations. Old things have passed away. 
behold, new things has come. And Ron's a new person. Maureen's a new person. Yeah, outwardly we're the same, but inwardly we were changed. We love each other. Thank you.